Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. And what we have discussed in the previous module is that we can actually be able to study the interaction between the enzyme and the substrate or enzyme and the different type of ligand what are interacting with the enzyme with the help of different types of techniques. So in this context, what we have discussed, we have discussed about the chromatography techniques, uh, whether the chromatography techniques are going to be used for measuring the change in uh, shape or size of the molecule or whether it can be used for measuring the or detecting the uh, different types of charges onto the enzyme structures. And in addition to that, we have discussed about the couple of uh, spectroscopy techniques. We have discussed about the uh, isothermal titration colorimetry. And then in the previous lecture, if you recall, we have also discussed about the uh, surface plasmon resonance technique. So all of these techniques are very easy to perform and they are actually being and majority of these techniques are label free techniques. So they can be very easily or economical in terms of uh, usage. So with this, uh, we have understood that the enzymes are interacting with the substrate and uh, enzymes are catalyzing the different types of reactions. So if you recall, we have discussed about the different types of enzyme catalyzed reactions. We have discussed about the catabolic reactions and we have also discussed about the anabolic reactions. So when an enzyme is processing a substrate, what it is doing is enzyme is reacting with the substrate. Okay. And then it is actually forming the transition state which is called as enzyme substrate complex and then this transition state is getting converted into another transition state uh, which is called as the enzyme product transition state right and from the enzyme product you are actually going to have the uh, release of enzyme and you are actually going to have the generation of product, right? And this enzyme will again go into the cyclic manner and it will actually go and receive the another molecule of substrate. Now, what, how we can be able to measure the enzyme activity, right? So uh, uh, the ability of an enzyme to process the number of substrate molecule is actually going to be a direct measurement of the uh, activity, right? So number of uh, molecules. So if you want to measure the enzyme activity, you have two options. Either you can be able to count how many number of molecules of substrate are being used or you can be able to say how many number of molecules of products are being formed, right? So either you can be able to measure the formation of the product or you can be able to measure the depletion of the substrate and then only you can be able to measure the enzyme activity, right? Now, if you want to do this, you are actually going to have a very well um, uh, documented or well managed uh, infrastructure so that you can be able to measure the substrate or the product. And if you want to do that, you are actually should have the exclusive properties uh, related to either the substrate or the product, right? So you should have the exclusive properties. Uh, what is mean by the exclusive property is that these exclusive properties will not be present or will not be uh, present in any other species throughout this particular cycle, which means if you are measuring the substrate, it should not have that you are measuring the substrate, but at the same time, the product is also very much similar and is also giving you the similar reactions. And that's why if you want to do the enzyme activity, you require a, or you actually have to standardize a system which is called as enzyme assay. And in the enzyme assay, you are actually going to use the different types of uh, criteria or different types of conditions in which you are actually going to either measure the in uh, the uh, the depletion of the substrate or you are actually going to form uh, measure the formation of substrates. So in today's lecture, we are actually going to discuss about 
some of these aspects and how you can be able to set up the enzyme assay to measure the enzyme activity. So, as the name suggests, the enzyme assay is a assay where you are either going to measure the depletion of the substrate or the generation of the product. So, the enzyme's activity can be determined by determining the rate of product formation or the substrate used in the enzyme catalyzed reactions. Many enzyme get activity can be determined by the multiple assay procedures. The choice of assay depends on the cost, the availability of appropriate equipment and the reagent and the level of sensitivity required. So, this is very, very important parameter what you are supposed to consider when you are trying to develop an enzyme assay for measuring the enzyme activity. So, it depends on the multiple uh, procedures. It depends on the availability of the equipment such as the if you have the spectrophotometer or not right. So, if you have the spectrophotometer then only you can be able to or you should actually set up a assay where you are actually going to have the change in the usable region right. If you have the fluorimeter, you can actually be able to set up the uh, or design the enzyme assay accordingly. So, depending on the equipment, you are actually going to set up the enzyme assays. Then you also require the different types of reagents. Suppose, for example, I am trying to develop a protease assay. So, actually, I require the different types of proteins, right, because that is going to be the substrate, right. So, whether I should have that protein or not, then only I can be able to use or develop a protease assay, right. And then what is the level of sensitivity required? If you require an assay which actually can uh, work in the uh, micromolar range or millimolar range, then or versus whether you are looking for a sensitivity where you are actually going to measure the differences between the substrate and the product in the range of nanomolar range and so on. So, depending on the sensitivity, the cost is also will actually going to be, you know, go up. So, uh, all these are and, and the most important thing is cost actually because when you are trying to develop the enzyme assays, the cost is one of the very, very important parameters because that is actually going to decide how many number of reactions uh, you can be able to perform, right. So, if you are actually going to uh, run a assay where the cost is uh, $10 for example. So, if you are actually going to have an assay which has $10 cost for every assay you are going to do like your, so your, this means you are actually going to use approximately rupees 1000 for performing single reactions, right. So, this is going to be very, very costly. So, that also is actually going to be a limiting factor to go and adopt that particular type of enzyme assay because if you can measure the enzyme activity even with the cheaper options, maybe you may have to compromise with the sensitivity and other things, but you will actually at the end you will get the answer, right. Uh, then we also, it is essential that you ensure that the NESA procedure which gives a true measure of the activity of an enzyme. So, that is very, very important that when you develop the assay, it should actually give you the right readouts and it should give you the uh, real assay or real procedure. So, in this procedure, you should actually first for figure out what are you are going to measure and whether it, there will be a cross reactivity because as I said in the uh, past also, right, in the previous slide also, that the substrate and products are not very different, but they are different in terms of some of the properties. For example, if you are measuring an assay where your glucose is getting converted into uh, glucose 6-phosphate, uh, these two are very, very different except that you are actually going to have a phosphate group which is attached to this substrate, uh, this product actually, right. So, uh, you are actually can only use this as a probe to measure, right. So, that is how you should have a very good procedure in which you should not get misguided and you are measuring something which may not be reflecting the activity of an enzyme. All the potential problems may be avoided by carefully experimental design and adequate control. So, when you are trying to develop the enzyme assays, 
you are going to have two reactions. One reaction one, which is actually going to be blank, or I will say control, right? Where you are going to have everything except you can actually be able to uh, remove the enzyme. Then you are going to have the reaction two, where you are actually, or I will say, this is actually the test reactions. Sometimes you may also have the multiple types of blanks. For example, you can have the control for enzyme. You can also have the control for substrate. You can also have the control for other things, right? So if that is the case, uh, you should be a little more uh, you know, careful and you should actually be able to set all these reactions. Then only you can be able to measure the enzyme activity. Some seemingly abnormal behavior in enzyme assay can provide valuable information about the properties of enzyme being studied. So when you perform the enzyme assay, it is actually going to say how the substrate is going to be processed and how it is actually going to convert that into the product. And this is actually a very, very important information. It actually going to tell you the behavior of that particular enzyme because if you do a subtle change in pH or subtle change in temperature or pressure or other kind of environmental parameters, it is possible that the same enzyme probably may be start processing the different types of substrate. It may start, you know, generating the different types of product and so on. So that would be a very, very abnormal behavior of the enzyme assays. And uh, that is going to be also give you the very, very critical information. Now, when you try to develop the enzyme assays, uh, you also go, going to see the different types of behavior of these enzymes, right? Enzyme assays. So, these uh, behavior is actually going to give you a lot of information about the enzyme and its interaction with the substrate and how it is actually processing the substrate to actually giving you the product. So, let's see what are the different types of behavior of the assay. So, uh, when you are going to study the behavior of the assay, you can actually be able to expect that the reaction is actually going to process in these three, uh, these three way, right? Uh, it can either be a curve A, it can follow a curve B, or it actually can follow a curve C. Uh, in either of these cases, what will happen is that when you are actually going to run an enzyme assay for time versus product, right? And if, suppose you are measuring the product, what will happen is that initially it is actually going to be a linear and then it is actually going to saturate, okay? So this is actually the non-linear regions and this is the linear region, right? and uh, it actually can follow different path it may actually linear uh, it can be linear or it can be uh, reaching to this point much faster and it can actually be able to not be able to reach this okay so that's how it is going to, going to have the three different types of curves so when you do the reaction progress curve or you are going to monitor the enzyme assay and you are going to see how the enzyme is actually processing the substrate and it is actually going to give you the product. And if you are measuring the product, not the depletion of substrate, what you are going to see is, you're going to see the multiple types of uh, curves, right? So initially the time course is linear. So what you see here is that in this area, the time course is linear. For example, in this one also up to this, it's linear actually and it started that plateau actually. So this is the non-linear region. This is in fact, it, no, there's no change in product, right? However, the rate of product formation began to slow over time and linearity is lost. There are several reasons for the loss of linearity, okay? So these are the three type of model, a model which can be possible. So a model progress curve of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. A, when you are going to get A, when the enzyme has the high value of both Km and the Vmax. So if I think you should not be worried about the Km and Vmax, but these are the assays what you're going to see is when the both the Km and as well as the Vmax is going to be very high. Uh, then uh, the curve B you are going to get when the when the Km and the Vmax values are lower. So these are the curve what you're going to get. And the curve C is the reaction where the reaction rate is slowing because the enzyme is unstable and it loses activity at a constant rate with a complete inactivation having occurred before all the substrate has been 
converted. So this is the reaction where you are expecting an enzyme which is not very stable. So it's not stable. And what happened is that the concentration of enzyme is also changing. So the, here what happened is that the concentration of enzyme is changing over the time. Okay. So you can imagine if that happens, then it is actually going to keep processing the lower and lower and lower substrates. And that's how the enzyme, instead of increase in enzyme, uh, uh, instead of increase in pr product formation, there will be a decrease in product formation. And that's how this is not going to be the good. So you can actually have the three scenarios, A, B, and C. And why there is a loss of linearity? So there are multiple reasons why there is a loss of linearity in this particular system. Or I will say why the system actually get reaches to the saturation. So uh, the number one reason is that you are actually going to have the substrate depletions, right? Because enzyme, what enzyme is doing is enzyme is processing the substrate and it is generating the product, right? So if there will be a substrate depletion or if there will be a decrease in substrate concentration, right? Because this is equilibrium, right? So if the decrease in substrate concentration, enzyme will not have the adequate substrate so that the, uh, the binding should occur and that's how it is actually going to be get converted into the product. Then it's also going to be because there is a change in equilibrium, right? So because there is a, um, you know, because all these are under equilibrium, so uh, product is getting converted or it's actually uh, uh, reversible actually. So it, at equilibrium, uh, the concentration of the, so initial concentrations are high, but uh, the re, the, when the system reaches to the equilibrium, the forward reaction and reverse reactions are equal. And as a result, uh, there, you will see that it is actually going to adopt the plateau. For example, in this case, right, forward reaction and the reverse reaction is actually going to be equal. And that's how it will not go down. So uh, it will go linearly to some extent, and then it will actually going to attain the equilibrium. And that's how it is actually going to have the um, plateau or there will be a loss of linearity. The number three is uh, the product inhibition. So you can have the product inhibitions, and this is actually also going to be called as uh, feedback inhibition, right? So when you have the, you know, some product is formed, right? So this product could be a inhibitor for the enzyme, and that's how uh, initially it may not be having significant impact, but when the a lot of product is formed, it is going to inhibit the enzyme and that's how it is actually going to make the curve linear or not, uh, there will be loss of linearity. Then the fourth point is the instability of one of the component of the enzyme assays. So when you are actually going to use the different types of components, some component could be uh, temperature sensitive, for example, right? So when you and majority of these assays are being performed at 37 degrees Celsius, right? Because that is the temperature at which most of the enzymes are, uh, you know, showing the activity, optimal activity, right? So, but the components could be temperature sensitive. For example, if you are using the ATP, right? So ATP is good, ATP is stable molecule. But at 37 degrees Celsius, the auto oxidation of the ATP to give you the ADP plus PI is very high, right? And as a result, there will be a degradation of ATP. And that's how it may actually going to not available for, uh, you know, for uh, enzyme for catalyzing the reactions. And that's how it can actually be able to give you the non-linearity or the product is stop, uh, you know, going up, right? Then uh, you can also have the time dependent inhibition. So there is a in a time dependent inhibition is also like product inhibition that after some time the uh, system is reaching to the equilibrium or after some time the product is formed which is actually going to have the inhibitions. Then uh, sometime you can also have this kind of behavior where you can actually losing the uh, linearity because there is a artifacts in the system so it's actually uh, you know artificially showing the the, you know, the plateau but it is actually not 
and the number seems is uh, change in the assay conditions so this is very important right you are actually going to have the change in ph or temperature so when you are actually going to have that for example in some enzymes what happen is that when the enzymes are processing the substrate for example at this site when you are actually doing it initially right so in the initial reaction uh, you have set the ph everything right but when the product is forming and suppose the product is acidic in nature right so if the product is forming which is you know acidic right so that is going to slowly going to start affecting the ph okay in other cases uh, sometime you are actually going to have the sa where the sas are endothermic right so when the product is forming it is actually also affecting the temperature although majority of these assays are always been done in the incubators or they are actually been done in the water bath so you always maintain the regular temperature but uh, the ph is always can be modulated right because if you are forming some acid like for example if you are generating the lactic acid right so lactic acid is a acid right so it is actually going to impact the ph of the media and as a result uh, the initially the ph is 7.4 but when the lactic acid is started producing the ph could actually come down to 5 right for example so if the enzyme is optimally active at 7.4 but it may not be active at 5 and that's how you might be able to see that there is a loss of linearity so these are some of the reason why you could be able to see a loss of linearity and uh, because of this reason majority of the people what they do is they are actually using this part of the curve only for measuring the enzyme activity so they don't allow or they don't use the whole curve for measuring the enzyme activity because this is the curve which is very very reliable and uh, compared to this because at this point you are actually reaching to saturation and at when you are reaching to a saturation there are many things what can actually go wrong you can actually have the substrate depletions you can actually have the product inhibition and so on and you can also have the uh, uh, you know sometime artifacts which are actually also possible so that's why the this is the initial curve where you are actually going to do a lot of measurements and majority of the enzyme kinetics people are using this particular curve what are the different uh, features of this initial measurements are so what you when you do the initial measurements what you are going to do is initially the rate of product formation is linear with respect to time but as there is there are many reason for the loss of linearity over time to avoid such complexity is it important to measure the initial rates okay this means you are actually going to measure only in the initial part of the curve right because that is going to be linear and you know that a linear part is actually going to give you the accurate information frequently the linear portion of an assay is sufficiently extended to allow the initial rate to be accurately estimated simply by drawing a tangent or taking a first derivative or the early part of the progressive curve okay so this is this is very easy because when you are doing the initial curve it can actually be able to extend it and then or that's how uh, or you can actually be able to derive the equations and that's how you can be able to use that part of the uh, curve to calculate the uh, different uh, you know properties or different uh, kinetic parameters of the enzyme the concentration of the enzyme is reducing to prolong the linearity of the progressive curve whereas the loss of linearity is very rapid this also increases the sensitivity of the assay so when you are doing the initial rate measurements you are also going to increase the sensitivity of the assay because in this particular range in this particular curve the uh, the, uh, the the assay is very sensitive suppose you add any kind of inhibitor this actually is going to get affected it's possible that the saturation point may not get affected but this portion is going to be get affected it has frequently been assumed that the limiting measurement of reaction rate to a period in which less than 10 to 20% of the total substrate consumed will provide a true the initial rate measurements okay 
Starting an assay by introducing one of the component and ensuring adequate mixing can lead to the considerable uncertainty about the precise time and the reaction had begun. So one of the major issue with the initial measurement is that you are not very sure about when you have started the reaction because uh, when you are going to add one component, the last component, then the reaction is going to start. But the precise time when the reaction had begun uh, is very difficult to say, right? So sufficient time must be allowed to adjust the initial conditions such as the linearity is maintained for enough time to measure the initial rate. So it's not only important that you are actually going to make the initial measurement. It's also important that you allow the enzyme to get stabilized because, because Initially, the enzyme is actually going to take time to recognize the substrate. Then it is also going to, you know, start catalyzing. It's not like it started jumping on all the substrate and then started eating them, right? Or started converting them. So it's actually going to be a molecular interactions and uh, initially the molecular interactions are going to be slow. And then it's actually going to catalyze. So that's why it is not important that you do measurement in the as early as possible you can actually let the enzyme to get stabilized get uh, you know started reactions and then you actually can measure okay and then you can have the entire progress curve must be taken into account when measuring the complex enzyme assays where substrate depletion and equilibrium is not the sole reason for the loss of linearity in the progress curve now you can see that even if you are doing the measurement in the initial curve, there are many issues related to even the initial measurement as well. And the first issue is the burst and the lag in the progress curve. So what you can see here is that I am showing you the two curve where the later part of the curve, right? This part of the curve is different from the this part of the curve, right? This part of the curve is actually showing a phenomena which is called as burst, right? This means the enzyme is starting very rapidly. Whereas in this case, what you see here is that this part of the curve is very different from the this part of the curve. So this part is actually showing a lag phase, which means the enzyme is taking very long time actually to recognize the substrate and actually going to catalyze the reactions. So if you are measuring the reactions in the initial time curve or initial uh, very initial time curve, then you are actually going to make a mistake because if it is a burst conditions, you are actually going to do the uh, overestimations. Okay. And if it is a lag kind of enzyme, you are actually going to make the uh, underestimations. So before the linear phase of the reaction, in some cases, there is a, either a burst or lag in the product formation. And the potential reason includes is inadequate temperature control. So sometimes what happens is that there is a, you know, temperature is not isothermic. So it's actually going either be very high, whereas in the case of burst or it could be very low. In the case of in, in the case of lag, so that actually is also going to control the activity of the enzyme. Then sometimes when you are set when you are doing the reactions, uh, the the reaction components may not be soluble into the buffers and they will be keep settling during the reaction. So what happen is that suppose this is a uh, test tube, right? And I have taken the enzyme when I have taken the enzyme all the components. So what happen is that some of the components are particulate, right? So what will happen is they will go. So after some time, what will happen is they will actually going to be settled down at the bottom, right? And once the enzyme is present here, right? So enzyme is present in the solution, but they are the, the some of these particles, which are also important for the reactions, are settling down at the corners. So that's how they were actually going to, uh, you know, change the uh, reaction rates, and may, they may actually induce the lag or burst. Then uh, sometimes we have the slow detector response, which means your measuring uh, devices are also having the fault. So they will be actually either measuring the very quickly or they were taking time to measure. And because of that, enzyme is catalyzing its reactions, but you are measuring uh, very slowly. So that's why you can actually have this particular type of curve. Uh, Sometimes you have the slow dissociation of a reversible inhibitor or the activator. So in that case, if you have slow inhibitions 
uh, it may actually be able to you know have the uh, lag phase a longer lag phase or if you have the slow dissociation of activator you may have the burst and uh, that's why these are the two phenomena which actually going to make the initial measurements wrong then you can have the pre steady state transients or relief of the substrate inhibition or activations then you can also sometimes have the activation of the product so this is very very interesting because when you have the product which is actually been uh, working as an activator so what happen is that in the lab phase what happen is that when the enzyme is uh, you know converting a, uh, converting a substrate into the product and then the product is actually you know working as an activator so initially the curve is actually going to be slow but as soon as some amount of product is formed it is actually going to activate the enzyme and that's how it is actually going to you know uh, activate the activity of the enzyme then you can also have the substrate interconvergence which means the substrate are actually going to be get converted to each other and that's how they are also going to affect the burst or the lag, lag phase in the progress curve so the time course of the enzyme catalyzed reaction showing the burst or the lag phase before the steady state rate is obtained this is all about the enzyme so in an enzyme when you are actually going to do an enzyme catalyzed reaction what you are going to do is you are actually going to have these right this means you are going to have the product and the enzyme is being formed right and if i set up the reactions what i am going to do is i am going to set the blank reactions right so in a blank reaction what i am going to do is i am going to take the buffer right where i am going to catalyze for example this ph 7.4 right and i am going to add the any kind of salt or additives for example in this case i am supposed keeping it 100 millimolar nacl so it's actually going to give me uh, some provide some uh, some kind of uh, biological environment and uh, i'm going to add the some amount of uh, substrate so for example if i if this is a atps for example so i'm going to add like atp which is 10 millimolar right and that's it okay and then i'm going to add the substrate so i'm going to add the substrate like uh, for example glucose okay so 100 millimolar for example okay so i'm going to add the glucose so i'm going to add the atp and everything remember that i have not added the enzyme so this is actually going to be a blank reaction so imagine that i got an od after 10 minutes for example okay so if i did the incubations after 10 minutes i am going to get a od of 0.4 so this is the 0.4 absorbance okay so this is the od values now i am going to do a test reaction okay so test reactions i am going to have everything i am going to have the buffer i am going to have the salt so everything I'm going to take from the blank reactions, I'm going to have the ATP and I'm also going to have the glucose, right? And at the end, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the enzyme. So for example, I have added 10 units of enzyme. So, and then I will start the reactions and after 10 minutes, I am going to have an OD of 0.8, for example. Okay, this means uh, if I want to know what is the enzyme catalyzed reactions OD, so what is the change in OD, right? So what I am going to do is I am going to do the test OD minus blank OD. Okay, this means 0.8 minus 0.4 and that is the 0.4 OD what is being changed when the enzyme was added right and this is what you are actually going to calculate after every time points like one minute two minutes five minutes like that okay and what you will see is that this matter this uh, value is also going to be changed for example if I do it after one minute I may have a value of 0 0.05 if I do the after five minutes, I will have the value of 0.1 and so on. So this value is very, very important because this is actually going to change 
your final values okay and that's why this value is actually going to be contributed by the blank rates or blank reactions right and the blank reactions are very very important in a enzyme assays so blank assays or blank rates so sometimes the apparent rate of reaction is observed even in the absence of one of the component of complete assay which are called as and that are called as blank rates right and blank rates are very important because they are actually going to be decide what would be your final rates of an enzyme because if the blank rates are very high for example if i are getting a od of 0 0.8 0 0.9 then your uh, you know the sensitivity is actually will be very low because the blank rates are very high so it is important to ensure that the determined rates from a particular assay is only due specific reaction uh, is only due to the specific enzyme catalyzed reactions so potential cause for the blank rates include uh, settling of the particles precipitations contamination of one of the component of the assay react mixture adsorption to the assay vessels and non enzymatic reactions so this is the non enzymatic reaction the blank what i am talking about or some of the contaminating enzymes so that are also going to be responsible how how you going to correct about the blank rates right in many cases the two rate of the enzyme catalyzed reaction can be obtained simply by subtracting the blank rate given in the suitable incomplete mixture from the rate obtained with the full assay so that's why i said you know when you subtract the 0.4 from 0.8 that is what you are going to get so this is actually the corrected uh, od values for the this particular time point for example 10 minutes right and that's how you can be able to overcome the blank rates because ideally if when i am not added the enzyme i you know ideally there should be no uh, formation of product but in some of these cases you are actually going to see some of the enzyme which is going to be formed this method assumes that the blank rate is an artifact unrelated to the activity of enzyme under study. That is continuous linearity for the duration of NSA and that it remains constant throughout the assay. In some cases where these assumptions are correct, failing to subtract the blank rate will result in the visible kinetic abnormalities. Then if the blank rates occurs, failing to subtract it results in a plot of initial velocity versus enzyme concentration that does not pass to the origin but exhibit finite activity as a zero enzyme concentration. If the apparent blank rate is due to the particle settling, subtracting the initial blank rate from the initial subtracting the initial blank rate from the initial rate obtained after starting the reaction may be sufficient. However, such rates are normally irregular and it is preferable to wait for the blank rate to decline and the assay to stabilize before measuring the rates. In a more complicated system in which it is inappropriate to subtract an apparent blank rate can occur when the enzyme can catalyze the decomposition of one of the substrate alone but the presence of the second substrate suppresses these reactions. So the dependence of the initial rate on the enzyme concentration. So what you're going to see here is that the initial reactions are or initial measurements actually depends on the concentration of the enzyme and they are also going to be very, very sensitive for the these blank rates, okay? Because the blank rates actually can reduce the OD values. So what you see here is that I have shown you how the enzyme concentration is actually going to change the rate of the uh, product formations. So uh, in the line B, what you see, so it's three conditions, A, B, and C, okay? So B is shows the expected dependent line, which means it is actually going to show you a linearity at 45 degree angle, okay? So this is actually going to be ideal. Whereas A and C showed the possible result from the incorrect treatment of the blank rate. In line A, the blank rate occurred in the absence of enzyme has not been subtracted. So uh, this is actually the ideal rates what you're going to measure in the absence or in the when there is no, uh, you know, the blank rates. But if you have the blank rates and if you don't subtract those blank rates, then you are actually going to expect a curve which is look like as 
the curve given in the A. Whereas the C, a blank rate occurs in the absence of one of the substrate, but it is suppressed in the full assay has been subtracted. So this is actually the under representation. This is the over representations of the same enzyme assays because the blank rates are affecting that. So the effect of the enzyme concentration on the enzyme kinetics or the product formation can be of two types. It can be directly proportionality. So in most cases, the initial velocity of the reaction is directly proportional to the concentration of the enzyme. The graph of initial velocity again total enzyme concentration will be straight line passing through the origin. So that is what I have shown you, right? This is actually going to be like this. So initial rates are very, very sensitive for the concentration of the enzyme. And this is not true in all cases of derivation from this linearity, maybe due to change in assay condition and with the time like change in pH or the ionic strength, it is important to take this factor into consideration. So you can have the two different types of effects when you are going to see the effect of enzyme on the initial rate measurements. It can have the upward curvature or you can also have the downward curvatures. So let's see what is the upward curvature. So when you are actually going to see how the enzyme concentration is going to induce the upward curvature, so there are two reasons for this type of behavior. So what you're going to see is that when you are actually increasing the enzyme, what you see is that there is an increase in upward curvature, right? Which means the velocity is increasing. And uh, so these are the initial rates, okay? So there are two reasons for this kind of behavior. The presence of a small amount of a irreversible inhibitor of the enzyme in the assay mixture and the presence of dissociable activator in the enzyme solution. So upward curving dependency of initial velocity on the enzyme concentration. So curve A shows the normal expected relationship, right? So this is the curve A, which is going to show a linearity, right? Linearity between the uh, enzyme concentration versus, uh, versus uh, you know, velocity of the enzyme, uh, velocity of the reactions. Whereas the B represent the case where there is a irreversible inhibitor contaminating the assay mixture. So B is the time place where when you are actually going to have the irreversible inhibitors and because of that there will be a delay in uh, initial uh, kinetics and that's how it is actually going to show you the linearity afterwards. And then the C is the show the possible behavior if there was a reversible inhibitor activator. Uh, present in the enzyme preparation. So when you are actually isolating the enzyme, it also contains one of the activator along with it. So when this activator is present, it is actually going to activate the enzyme activity over the course of time and that's why it is actually going to show you an upward curve. Then you can also have the downward curvatures. So there are uh, three common scenarios that can result in a curvature curve with a downward curvature where the reaction rate appears to be reach maximum at a high concentration rate. The detection method may become rate limiting at the high rate concentration. So these are the downward curvature depend on the initial velocity of the concentration. So what you are going to have is when you are keep increasing the enzyme concentrations, initially it will be linear but later on it is actually going to be downwards, okay? And one of the major reason is that the detectors or the detection system what you are going to use for these kind of assays um, may not be, you know, will be the rate limiting, which means they will not be able to measure the, uh, the substrate or the product what is being formed, which means when the enzyme is reacting with substrate and it is forming the product, the concentration of product is very high. So concentration of product is very high and as a result it is actually reaching to a saturation level and because of that it is actually going to show you a downward curvature then failure to measure the true initial rate of the action because of the you know responses of these uh, instruments and other kind of thing you will not be able to do the in real initial measurements of the curve reactions and the presence of dissociable inhibitor in the enzyme solution so sometimes you may have some kind of inhibitors and that may also getting dissociated and that's how it is actually going to show you the downward curvature. Now whether you are getting the upward curvature or whether you are getting the downward curvature, the enzyme is actually going to show you uh, activity, right? 
which means because of this activity the enzyme is going to convert the substrate into the product now the question is how you are going to express this activity uh, and how you can be able to use that information for determining the other kinds of parameters so how you can be able to express this activity because you can have the you know enzyme from the multiple sources you can have an enzyme from animal source you can have the enzyme from plant sources and so on so how you will compare which enzyme is more active and which enzyme is less active and so on so there is a universal activity what is our activity definition that is what required to compare the enzyme from the different sources even the same enzyme from the different sources so the expression of the enzyme activity so one of the unit is unit and the specific activity that is the universally very very popular way of expressing the enzyme activity so what is the one unit of enzyme so the most uh, used quantity to express the activity of enzyme is the unit of enzyme sometimes referred to as the international unit or the enzyme unit what is the one unit of enzyme it is defined as the catalyzing the conversion of one micromole substrate or the formation of one micromole product in one minute the specific activity of an enzyme preparation is the number of units per milligram of proteins if the relative molecular mass of an enzyme is known the activity can be expressed as the molecular activity which is defined as the number of units per micromole of enzyme in other words the number of moles of product formed or substrate used per mole of enzyme per minute and that will actually going to give you the uh, molecular activity because an enzyme molecules may contain more than one active site this may actually may this may not correspond to the number of mole substrate converted per enzyme active site per unit if the number of active site per mole is known the activity can be expressed as the catalytic center activity which corresponds to the moles of substrate used or product formed per catalytic center per minute or so this is the uh, you know so the enzyme activity can be expressed in three ways one is you can express it in the terms of unit you can express it in terms of a specific activity which is uh, equivalent to unit divided by milligrams of protein or you can actually be able to express in terms of the catalytic center activity so catalytic center activity where you are actually going to say that unit of enzyme divided by the number of active sites okay so number of active site of the group okay and uh, either of these three way you can actually be able to express the enzyme activity but recently the people have also adopted the new uh, activity um, units for measuring the enzyme activity so one of the that unit is cattle although the unit of enzyme activity and the quantity derived from it proven to be most useful the international union of biochemistry and nomenclature commission iupsc uh, has recommended the use of cattle abbreviated to cat as an alternative so one cattle correspond to the conversion of one mole of substrate per second thus it is inconveniently large quantity compared to unit so the relationship between the cattle and the units are one cattle is equivalent to 60 moles per minute or 6 into 10 to the power 7 units so you can actually be able to use this uh, unit which is a recent unit and uh, the convert the the relationship between the cattle and uh, unit is that one cattle is equivalent to uh, 6 into 10 to the power 7 units or one unit is equivalent to 16.67 nano cattle However, in terms of the molar or catalytic center activity, the cattle is not such a large quantity and it is consistent with the general expression of the rate constant in the uh, per second. While you are doing this activity measurement, stoichiometry is very important. So it is important to keep in mind the stoichiometry of the reaction when expressing the activity of the enzyme. Sometimes the enzyme catalyzes reaction two moles of the same substrate, for example, the two ADP, right? So in that case, you might have to, you know, change the uh, concentrations accordingly. 
so the activity will be twice as large as it is expressed in terms of ADP utilizes than if it is expressed in terms of the formation of either product. When the expressing an enzyme activity, it is critical to specify the substrate or the product as well as the stoichiometry. Now, there are multiple way or multiple conditions what you have to consider before you are going to design an enzyme assays and you are going to use that for measuring the activity. So, conditions for the activity measurements. So, although the velocity or the enzyme concentration is a useful constant for comparison, it will also be constant under the specific conditions, for example, the pH, temperature and the substrate concentration, because many of these parameters are actually going to change the enzyme activity. And that's why it is important that you should also define that at what pH, at what temperature and at what con initial concentration of the substrate you are getting this activity because it's not that the enzyme is actually going to show you the same activity even if you are doing the reaction at 4 degree or 27 degree or something like that. So that's why the enzyme activity you are actually going to show but you also have to show the activity conditions in which what temperature you have used or what uh, pH you have measured and all that because if you even if you do like uh, pH measurements and if you do the activity at a pH where the enzyme is not very active it's not going to show you the activity. The temperature of 30 degrees Celsius has become widely used as a comparative standard but in some cases a more physiological temperature may be preferable. There is no particular pH and substrate concentration is recommended. Often the optimal values are preferred for the specific case, but to get the activity of enzyme in vivo conditions, physiological pH should be used. Now, you have we have discussed uh, so what we have discussed, we have discussed about the different types of enzyme activities. We have measured how we can be able to or express the enzyme activity. We have also um, discussed how the different parameters are actually going to impact the activity measurements, the initial rate constant and all that. Now we should discuss how uh, on different ways in which you can be able to measure the enzyme activity. So type of enzyme assays. So enzyme assays could be of two types, either they will be direct continuous assay or they could be indirect continuous assay. So although many enzyme catalyzed reaction product produce change in the property of reactant that are relatively easy to measure directly and continuously, others do not. Necessitating the use of an indirect method that involves some additional treatment of the reaction mixture. In some cases, such direct measurement can use to continuously monitor the progress of reaction, but in their cases, reaction must be stopped before further treatment of the assay mixture can be determined. So, we will see that when we are going to discuss some of the assay mixtures and when we are going to discuss about some of the uh, reaction conditions, you will see that how the some of the assays are continuous direct measurements and some are, are uh, continuous indirect measurements. So, one is the continuous direct measurements. So, any difference in the substrate property than the product can be used directly measure, can be used to provide the basis for direct assays. Direct assay means the enzyme is uh, making a substrate and it is forming the product, right? And you can easily measure this product directly, which means either the product is colored or the substrate is colored and you can actually be able to measure how much the substrate left, right? So either of these cases, you can actually be able to do direct measurements. Individual assay, uh, individual uh, activity has been measured using fluorescence, pH, optical rotations, conductivity, enthalpy, viscosity, or the volume of the reaction mixture. Direct continuous assay are always preferred because they allow the observation of progress curve, which simplifies the estimation of the initial rates and allow the detection of any anomalous behavior as long as the sensitivity is sufficiently high. and the procedure does not impose undesirable limitations on the assay condition that can be used. So it is very easy and it is straightforward. That straightforward you see that the product is forming and that's how what you can do is you can just plot the product with time. Okay, And that's how you can be able to calculate the initial rate constant. You can actually be able to use that for calculating the different types of other kinds of kinetic parameters whether the KM, KCAT and all that kind of thing. 
so that is desirable but many of the cases what happen is the neither the product is uh, very uh, good in terms of unique unique properties or substrate is also not good in terms of unique properties so that you can use that to measure and there is a interference so when you are having that kind of assay you are actually going to use the indirect methods to measure the assays so indirect assays or indirect measures so indirect you can have discontinuous indirect assays you can have the continuous indirect assays so discontinuous assay where you are actually going to have like enzyme plus substrate forming a product and then you are actually going to recover or you can actually be able to purify this product and then you are going to put it into another reactions okay and that's how it is actually going to be the discontinuous indirect assay so these assays also known as sampling assay involve stopping the reaction after a predetermined amount of time and treating the reaction mixture to separate a product for analysis or produce a change in the property of one of the substrate or product that can then be measured radiochemical assays are the examples of the uh, these kind of assays so for example you can have the atp plus luciferin plus oxygen and it is actually going to give you the oxyluciferin okay and these are this is the one of the assay which actually can be used to measure the atp for example so if suppose this is the assay what i am doing right glucose plus atp giving glucose 6 phosphate plus adp so if i want to measure this it is very difficult so what i am going to do is i am going to recover the atp and i am going to put that into this assay and that's how it can be used for measuring the atp concentrations because the oxyluciferin is actually going to give you the light and that light can be measured by measuring the light emission in the presence of firefly luciferase the formation of or the disappearance of atp can be determined similarly you can have the nadph fmn and it is actually going to give you the nad plus and uh, here also you are going to have the FNNF2 is formed right, and that can be put into this reaction and that's how it is actually going to produce the light and that light can be measured. So this is actually going to be a indirect method because after some time you have to take out these reactions and then you have to measure the ATP. You cannot do uh, simultaneously. Then we can have the continuous indirect assays. So continuous indirect uh, uh, method where you are actually going to have the indirect measurements it means the substrate is actually going to product is actually going to measure but you don't have to aliquot you can actually be able to add something and then the product is actually going to form the p prime and that is actually going to have the exclusive property which can be measured so this type of assay entail forming the manipulating manipulations required to detect product formation or product remaining within the assay mixture in such a way that the change can be tracked continuously as such as it occurred. Such assay should allow for the determination of the progress curve in a single assay, making them the less prone to errors caused by the sample manipulation required in a discontinuous assay. So the continuous assays are uh, much better because uh, they are actually going to reduce. First of all, they are actually going to make the things faster right because you can actually be able to add everything and then it's actually going to give you the direct measurements the second is it is actually going to be uh, less prone to the artifacts because in this particular system when you are aliquoting the reactions uh, mixtures uh, and you are actually taking out some amount it is actually not going it's going to interfere with the enzyme kinetics in the assay mixture Reagent that react with one of the reaction product to form a detectable compound can be included. To yield the to yield the valid results, the detection reaction must be so fast that the reaction catalyzed reaction is always rate limiting, so that the rate determined component to the activity of enzyme under assay. This is very important uh, parameters when you are trying to design the uh, con continuous indirect assays. Then we have the coupled assays. So coupled assays means you are, this is the example of coupled assay where the glucose is getting converted into glucose 6-phosphate with the enzyme of the hexokinase. So if we want to measure the activity of hexokinase, we have two options. Either we couple the formation of ATP to some system or we can actually be able to couple the glucose 6-phosphate to another system, right? 
So we can actually put the glucose 6 phosphate to glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase, and that's how it is actually going to show me a uh, depletion of NAD plus, right? And that can be monitored both ways. That can be monitored with the UV visible spectro um, photometer, or uh, it can also be uh, monitored with the help of the fluorescence because. Uh, these molecules are fluorescent molecules, so they can actually be able to show you the fluorescence. So, the most common type of assay uses one or more additional enzyme to catalyze a reaction of one of the products to yield a product compound that can be detected directly. This type of known is, this type of assay is known as coupled assay and the auxiliary enzyme used are often referred to as a coupling enzyme. Now, when you want to do a coupling reactions, okay. It is very important that the activity of this enzyme should be on a higher node, higher side compared to this enzyme, okay. So that it, the conversion of this substrate, conversion of this product to the this product should be um, faster because if, if, the, if this enzyme is fast and this enzyme is slow, then there will be an accumulation of the product and that is that is why it is actually not going to give you the direct measurement or the it is not going to give you the real image or real situation of the product concentrations. So, so it is very important that when you choose the coupled assays or when you try to develop the coupled assay, the coupling partners, the second enzyme which is actually going to be called as coupled enzyme. Uh, is should have a higher you know enzymatic activity so that there should be no accumulation of the product from the first reactions. So, this is the reaction 1 and this is the reaction 2 right and uh, reaction 2 should be fast so that there should be no accumulation of glucose 6 phosphate. So, this is all about the enzyme uh, cup, uh, assays, so what we have discussed, we have discussed about the basics of the enzymes. So, we have discussed about how, what are the different enzyme assay system, what you can use, what are the precautions and what are the factors which are actually going to impact the enzyme assays. And then we also discuss about the effect of enzyme concentration on the assay system and the purpose of this discussion is that so that you should be very careful in the with the concentration of the enzyme into the particular enzyme assay system. And then we also discuss about the role of baseline or the blank uh, rates and how it is actually going to impact the enzyme activity. And lastly, we have also discussed about the units of the enzyme activity and also we have discussed about the different types of enzyme assay setup, what you can actually be able to use to measure the enzyme activity. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. And if you want to this study or if you want to discuss some more about this uh, aspect, what we have discussed today, you can actually be able to refer this particular book and uh, I have taken the content from this book so it will be easy for you to follow the content. So with this I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.